You're listening to KPFA 94.1 in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno. Welcome to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. It's Friday, November 30th, 2012. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today we'll talk with Jonathan Greenberg, Executive Director of BeYourGovernment.org and NoGMO.org. How did Prop 37 fail in California when it started with over 90% of the voting public supporting the labeling of genetically modified foods? What role did big media play and big money? During the second half of the show, we'll interview Roger D. Harris of the Bay Area Latin American Solidarity Coalition as Roger's just returned from a human rights fact-finding trip from Honduras. At the end of the hour, we'll have an update on the United National Anti-War Coalition San Francisco Bay Tour on the U.S. drone war. But first, the KPFA News Headlines. Please stay with us. I'm Eileen Alfandiri with News Headlines. The second in a series of storms is bringing heavy rain and flood warnings to much of Northern California. The National Weather Service has issued a variety of warnings for heavy rain, snow, high winds, and flash floods from the San Francisco Bay Area to the Oregon border. Officials say intense rainfall is expected this morning before another storm hits Sunday. The service says small rivers and streams are at an increased risk for flooding and that the storm could cause flooding on roads and trigger rock and mudslides. Gusty winds could knock down trees and electricity lines, leading to power outages on the coast. There are gale warnings and small craft and high surf advisories. Prosecutors at the International Criminal Court say they will look at what yesterday's United Nations General Assembly vote will mean for Palestinian access to the world's first permanent war crimes tribunal. The U.N. General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to upgrade Palestine's status to a non-member observer state. In April, prosecutors had rejected a Palestinian bid to get the court to investigate possible war crimes during Israel's military offensive in the Gaza Strip four years ago. But in a one-paragraph reaction to the historic U.N. vote, the court's prosecution office said today it will consider the legal implications of this resolution. Jeffrey Nice is former chief prosecutor of the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He told Al Jazeera English, it looks as though Palestine could open a case against Israel. Although it is uncharted territory, this is a move in the direction of allowing the International Criminal Court to have jurisdiction over uh, war crimes that may be committed in this area. Yesterday's lopsided vote at the U.N. General Assembly was 138 to 9 with 41 abstentions. It came after Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abdras addressed the U.N. We did not come here to add further complications to the peace process, which Israel's policies have thrown into the intensive care unit. Rather, we came to launch a final serious attempt to achieve peace. The nine no votes came from Israel, the U.S. and Canada, joined by the Czech Republic, Panama, and several Pacific Island nations, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau. Here's U.S. Ambassador Susan Rice. Today's unfortunate and counterproductive resolution places further obstacles in the path to peace. That is why the United States voted against it. Israel today announced plans to build 3,000 new homes for settlers in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. The settlements are considered illegal under international law. The Haaretz news site described the new homes as part of a construction wave planned by Israel. Supreme Court justices are meeting this morning to decide whether to review California's same-sex marriage ban, Proposition 8. Prop 8 is one of ten related cases the court is considering today. Most of the others focus on the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. A federal appeals court ruled Proposition 8 unconstitutional. If the justices decline to review that ruling, same-sex marriage will once again be legal in the state. The court could announce a decision as soon as today or Monday. Any cases probably would be argued in March with a decision expected by the end of June. Several of the Defense of Marriage Act cases involve same-sex couples married in states where such marriages are legal, but who were denied federal benefits that heterosexual couples enjoy.
Labor talks are to resume today in an effort to end a strike that has shut down most of the terminals at the Los Angeles and Long Beach harbors, which constitute the nation's busiest port complex. A clerical workers union contends terminal operators have outsourced union jobs out of state and overseas. Longshore workers refuse to cross their picket lines, shutting down operations. Fast food workers at New York City McDonald's and other chains staged a one-day strike for higher pay and the right to form a union. The campaign called Fast Food Forward seeks to roughly double hourly pay to $15 an hour. It's being billed as the largest attempt to unionize U.S. fast food workers. This father of two told FSRN he and other workers can't afford to provide for their families on starvation wages. There's a lot of people that's in my situation is in a worse situation than what I am. And if this day come through, it will help them a lot too. You got people out here that have kids, that have families that they have to support. And we can't really do that with this low income. Strikes took place at McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut, and Domino's. The U.S. Senate resoundingly approved new sanctions on trade with Iran's energy, port, shipping, and shipbuilding sectors. The vote was 94 to 0. It's aimed at ratcheting up economic pressure on Iran, which the U.S. accuses of having a nuclear weapons program. Iran maintains its nuclear program is aimed at the use of nuclear power. Thousands of Egyptians are in Tahrir Square protesting against President Mohamed Morsi after a pro-Morsi panel rushed through approval of a new constitution. Egypt's Constituent Assembly adopted the draft constitution after a marathon all-night session. The assembly was boycotted by liberals and Christians. Al Jazeera English reporter Shireen Tadros reports from above Tahrir Square. People here are extremely angry. There are thousands already in Tahrir Square. Others are on their way because there are marches taking place across Cairo uh, and then they're all going to meet here in Tahrir so the climax may yet be to come in a few hours time and they're angry Foley not just because of individual moves that have been taking place in the last week whether that be uh, President Morsi's uh, controversial decree last Thursday or indeed what happened last night which is the constitutional draft being rushed through they're angry more um, widely or more generally about the fact that they feel that the Muslim Brotherhood and Mohammed Morsi has not been consultative. They haven't really um, thought about the people here or represented them in any way. Shireen Tadros, a reporter for Al Jazeera English. The global hacking network Anonymous said it will shut down Syrian government websites around the world in response to a countrywide Internet blackout believed aimed at silencing the opposition to President Bashar al-Assad. Syria was plunged into communication darkness yesterday when Internet connectivity stopped midday. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, rain winds 20 to 30 miles per hour, highs in the lower 60s, a flash flood watch in effect through Monday morning for the North Bay Peninsula and Santa Cruz mountains. In Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, rain highs in the mid-60s, a wind advisory in effect until 10 this evening. I'm Eileen Alfandari. I'll have more news at 10 on Letters and Politics. Be sure to join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome back to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today on the program, we'll begin by talking about Prop 37 and the labeling of GMOs, what happened in that campaign. With the bottom of the hour, we're going to discuss Honduras and civil rights issues in Honduras, and we'll end the program today with an update on the U.S. drone war. But first, here's Peter to introduce our first guest, Jonathan Greenberg. Peter? Ah, Jonathan Greenberg is an investigative journalist, author, and new media executive. He's part of Occupy Sebastopol, but he's also the creator of BeYourOwnGovernment.org and NoGMOs.org. That's K-N-O-W-G-M-O.org. He's the founder of uh, Progressive Source Communications, an activist in support of GMO labeling Proposition 37, which lost in this month's uh, election. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you, Peter. So, let's just get right to it here. How, how, why did Prop 37 lose when 90% of the people in earlier polls said they supported uh, GMO labeling? 
Well, this was the battle between humanity and grassroots uh, people who care about our health and our ecology and agrarian economies um, and and big business. The corptocracy pulled out all the stops. We were up against the six largest pesticide companies on Earth, including Monsanto, the company that brought us Agent Orange and DDT, and told us they were safe, as well as Dow, who brought us Bhopal, and um, as well as the largest junk food companies on Earth, Pepsi, Coke, etc., and on our side, we had the grassroots. And the way we lost was, number one, we were outspent from $47 million to $8 million. But even more than that, we lost sight of the grassroots um, in terms of the campaign. And the campaign was professionalized. So I wrote an article in the Huffington Post called 10 Grassroots Lessons from Monsanto's Swift Boating of Prop 37 to Label GMOs and laid out the concepts of, of what, what sort of we did wrong. Uh, basically, the long and short of it, is we brought peace signs and love beads to a gunfight with a ruthless uh, killer armed with assault rifles. Now that $47 million that was spent was primarily on television, correct? Uh, right. Virtually all of it was, yes. And we saw lots of ads about it's going to cost more money and, uh, this, you know, and there were literally lots. Can you talk about that, about the, the campaign side of uh, from the corporation's in terms of the misinformation that was directed. Sure. They hired the uh, tobacco lobbyist, you know, experts and messaging experts and, and some of the biggest and highest paid, you know, advertising people, the people, the same people who brought us things like death panels. And they're great at coming up with labels that are that 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 seize the public imagination and then buying ads that repeat them in the corporate media again and again and again. So their narrative was deceptive labeling scheme, shakedown lawsuits, and higher grocery bills. And in response to that, the campaign, uh, you know, the, the motto was, food is love, food is life, food is family. And what we did is we lost sight of this fact that what we have on our side, if they're going to spend eight times as much on advertising, which they did, and if they're going to lie with absolute impunity and basically get people in white suits to sit there and, and talk about the fact that the FDA says this is safe, why are they bothering and get working class looking actresses, you know, on, you know, at the grocery counter says saying $400 more a month for bills. You know, we've got to hit back with some something that is that that makes people care and we didn't make people care enough because i and, and again i wasn't part of the campaign i supported the campaign with no gno knw uh gmo.org with people powered media when and we, the grassroots people sort of lost power over this campaign the professionals came in and we needed to get people to care about their health the fact is gmos are you know have have not been thoroughly tested the testing we have seen is we are eating pesticides that stay in our body and are very likely to cause for many people serious health impacts um and and once we get, they did this polling the professional campaign and decided we people don't like negative advertising so we're going to keep it positive and talk about our right to know and food is love and so we lost our the greatest weapon we had and the other side had the doctors in white coats which really was was a switching of the narrative that uh, caused the decline in public support for this. We're speaking with Jonathan Greenberg talking about Prop 37 and how given that Prop 37 started with over 90 percent public support, how did it end up going down and defeat at the polls? Uh, it should also be noted, uh, just if even briefly, that all of the votes have not yet been counted. Is that right? Yes, yes. There still are unvoted county in the Southern California, probably another million or so to vote. But there's still 47, 48 percent. It's what gone it is. from 47.1 to 47.9, but it's unlikely with the trend line that we'll get there. But it is astonishing that it takes this long to uh, to count votes uh, right, in the United that, States. That, that's another program all, all together on elections in the U.S. We've certainly done those and we'll do more. Uh, you, you mentioned people-powered media, and the full title is people, People-Powered people Media to Counter Deceptive Corporate Ads. And your NoGMO.org site, KNOWGMO.org, uh, it's really a be-the-media um, type of a project, and th 
it's a it's again a a positive way for people to counter this massive money, this big corporate money and big corporate media. Can you talk a little bit more about that as part of the solution here? Sure. The concept is uh, the way we started beyourgovernment.org and occupygovernment.org uh last year beyourgovernment.com and and no gmo is that if we want to be the change we want to see then we need to replace the tv ads that are the methods by which too many all, most of american population is quote educated or miseducated those ads are 80% paid for by corporations in this case 100% paid for by corporations and replace those ads with our own actions over our social networks so the concept is is that we create videos you know that that speak of our own authentic viewpoints or truth or experiences and we can we have the, we create pages where people have their own web page to share with their social networks so that they could replace the ads that they realize are deceiving and and the instrument by which our democracy has been entirely subverted by big money one of the things that um the no folks were saying was that um, the law was poorly written, um, that it was going to cost more in the supermarket, both of which were unproven, but that message became quite strong. And even, as you were saying earlier, progressive people would ask, well, what's poorly written about it? And, and so the doubts that were put into people's minds were, were quite compelling, and the idea that you might have to pay more um, we didn't. That wasn't really countered very well. So no. what could what could have the campaign have done to be more aggressive in that regard? Well, the campaign had a circle the wagons type of of approach. They were high paid. They weren't high paid. They were professionals, and they didn't really utilize the grassroots. There was no money for billboards. There was no money for lawn signs. The lawn signs had to be paid for, which is astonishing. But they should have, it was in late August that the four message points came on on, on the website, very prominent on the no, uh, the no on Prop 37 website. The yes on 37 people within two days should have had a counter to every one of those points right there on the top of the yes on Prop 37 website, right there for everyone to message and send out. Instead, it took them six weeks to get messaging to counter these, these lies these deceptive claims and when they did you had to scroll down uh to reach it so they really did they allowed the big money to seize the narrative of course if you put in prop 37 in google or labeled gmos they lined up all the google keyword search terms so there was no way to find the ca right to know site they also had a bad name for a site ca right to know.com is you know per, that's why we got the know dot you know dot org so so they they really missed um a, a number of opportunities and they did not respond hard enough or fast enough and they knew you know we're in a gunfight with vicious you know and ruthless uh, liars um and they should have responded more quickly and more effectively and gotten into the aspect of public health because that's what people care about and let's let's talk a little bit about that but i wanted to first again re-reference this listeners can can find this is jonathan greenberg's article on huffington post this was from earlier in november about a week after less than a week after the election what was the full title again of the article 10 grassroots lessons from monsanto's swift boating of prop 37 to label gmos right and in a nutshell i just wanted to run down very quickly again for listeners get an idea about this and because we won't be able to get through all of, of some of these points but you talk about taking off the kid gloves uh, you also talk about making voters care and in order to do that uh, it's about health and safety and you were just mentioning here a minute ago about public safety and that's actually a fairly simple message so can you talk a little bit more about that and um, how we could go about things in a way to help people understand the significance of GMOs being in their foods. Sure. I mean, we basically we are eating corn that has that has uh, that has had its its cells genetically modified to contain pesticides. And there is this myth that that will die in your digestive system. And just because you're eating corn that contains pesticides, you're not eating pesticides because the nutrition goes in, but the pesticide goes out. It's been completely disproven by a Canadian study, of course, because our government will not study anything and the FDA is controlled. The, our food czar is a former Monsanto lobbyist. It's been disproved in a Canadian study that shows that more than 90% of babies born in in, in Canada 
have this Bt toxin built in, this pesticide built in, which causes cells to emit a pesticide and, and basically kill insects. So we're ingesting pesticides and you know, and of course, it causes more pesticides and to be used. So it really, it really is a, this this health concern. the uh, the best The best campaign for public health was the Alar Apple campaign, and they went right for the poison apple. Man, you go for the drug. Do kid, do moms want to serve their kids poison a- apples? We also had mothers. This was created by by a uh, Pam Larry, a mother in Chico, California. This campaign. We lost sight of the grassroots, you know, and it became about. Our right to know. And as, as, as one, uh, you know, linguist said to me, you know, they told us we had a right to know, but not why we need to know. We need to know because we want to protect our health, the health of our kids, and our ecology and our planet. Jonathan, um, you talk about the need for a paradigm shift in how conventional um, grassroots political campaigns are run. Um, what would we do different? What would you recommend doing different next time around? Is it we just simply can't beat them at television? Is that it? And where, where do we go with this? What does the paradigm shift mean? They have the money. We have the people. That's going to happen every single time we go against the corptocracy. We need to mobilize the grassroots and give them the tools that they have. Billboards was a great example in this case. There was zero budget for billboards. A woman in Yannick Phillips in Marin raised 15000 thousand dollars for billboards lawn signs were even more important there was no money for lawn signs we were told as volunteers you had to get ten dollars for each lawn sign when we should have been able to knock on a door and say here's a lawn sign can i put it here or not so we we made our volunteers go out and raise money instead of go out and spread the word and no and the idea of people powered media is and and they refused the campaign would not have anything to do with the no gmo project i just want to you know say that they did not want to promote it because people might be talking Talking about their health. I was like, you're kidding me, right? They said, no, and we need 100% of the money. So all their messaging was focused on the messages they created and buying television ads as opposed to giving people a tool to express and, and be an alternative media. That's right, uh, Jonathan Greenberg. Corporate media, you write in the article, uh, it, it's not the friend of the public and the public interest uh and it uh the way that corporate media framed this they really took it away from not only just being a right to know but what is in gmos and why gmos are problematic it's like scrubbed from yep. the whole issue and we let them do that mickey that was so difficult it was like watching a train wreck because i saw this in august when we'd encounter those ads we knew what their messages were, were going to be but you know once i w- once we gave up because it, people didn't want to go negative quote and by the way if that was true we'd still be at 91 percent because people would have rejected the negative ads um instead we're at 48 percent the the corporate media just hijacked the narrative and when Progressive friends of mine were saying to me, Jonathan, what is there about these exemptions and raising the price of food and that it's a bad bill, isn't it? It's like it wasn't a bad bill. It doesn't raise the price of food. These are all lies that have been repeated again and again on television. And the only way to get through that was to go grassroots, people to people. And in our ads that we did have and and our online ads, which we never bought, we talk about public health. This is a matter of safety. Do you want to feed your kids, you know, poison corn that contain pesticide containing corn? And we've seen, of course, uh, high fructose corn syrup and other GMO uh, related um, foods when tested on rats has contributed to organ failure. It's caused cancers. I mean, these are real problems. And, you know, over the years, uh, Project Censored has covered a lot of health related stories, GMO stories, EMF stories. Uh, Even in the new book, Censored 2013, we have stories on the dangers of everyday technologies and so on. And uh, as educators, Peter and I often see that, you know, these these issues really do resonate with students and and with people because it's suddenly not some abstract, esoteric uh, issue. You know, later on the program today, when we're talking about civil rights in Honduras and the U.S. drone wars, those are very real, very significant, crucial issues, but they're also issues that a lot of people here don't see, right, uh, because of the corporate media, and they're not there. But these are things, these issues, like this issues with GMOs, right, mm-hmm. everybody eats, 
everybody uses you know, some of these products. That, 80 80 percent of all corn and 90 percent of all soy that we buy is GMO so- co- corn, and unless they label it, we don't know that. Right, and this is so. This is the again the human guinea pig problem, and right back to the, your messaging issue. People not only have a right to know this, people really want to know this. They really want to know this because it's a fundamental right to know what they're eating. Uh, it affects their health. You mentioned that uh, uh, Pam Larry mm-hmm. uh, behind the campaign as a mother and certainly as parents here. You know, we're concerned about these issues because yeah. they have implications. This this is an example of a you know a matriarchal new paradigm grassroots movement that came about through mothers and grandmothers concerned about labeling fo- the food that they're feeding their children and their own health being hijacked in a sense when these women were told we need to hire the professionals who happen to be men who happen to say look we know how to do this you guys stay out of it we got to keep a message going and we've got to buy tv ads and don't talk to us you know about about you know the grassroots and about your health anymore you know we've done studies and we found people don't want to hear about it they want to hear about their right to know without telling them the need to know so this is also an example of the paradigmatic shift that's going to need to happen if humanity is going to be able to counter the power of the corptocracy, which will always own the corporate media, which will always have more money than we have. It seems that we really have to address the issue that GMOs may not be safe. And there's plenty of studies that indicate they are not. And for the past decade and a half, Project Censored has covered almost annually a new study about uh, GMO corn or soybeans or or whatever uh, fed to rats, and then they end up having shorter lifespans and a variety of other um, in-depth scientific material. But the FDA basically a decade ago said, well, GMOs are safe. And that's been the industry's capacity, what they're saying, whereas the rest of the world, particularly the EU, is saying, no GMOs. We don't want them grown here. We don't want them uh, sold here. And the U.S., Monsanto and the big corporations, you know, the breadbasket of the world, so to speak, is literally forcing these on, um, on various countries. And if there's a famine somewhere or an emergency, then it's GMO corn going in, whether it's Haiti after the earthquake or a variety of other places around the world. And many of these countries are rejecting that as well because there is... There, there's a kind of a loss of the precautionary belief with with FDA that we shouldn't be doing genetically modified materials in our bodies unless we're really sure it's safe, and, and we're not. And, and, and uh, it's astonishing that the that that we need to label pesticides, but when you're eating food containing pesticides, there's no need to label it. The FDA is controlled, has been controlled by Monsanto, and they have done no independent testing. They have relied upon Monsanto's own testing, you know, on its quote patented seeds, and refuses to even label it, even though the pesticides, when you spray them, need to be labeled. So, uh, Jonathan, what happens next? We've got about a minute left here. Um, where do we go from here, and what do you see as the anti-GMO uh, agenda in, in the United States? The grassroots is really mobilizing uh, the people behind Just Label It. Pam Larry is retrenching and really looking at a, you know, a, a, a mother-driven, a woman-driven uh, campaign that's truly grassroots. I think we're going to see some really new paradigmatic shift from the grassroots here in California. On a national level, there is a, a Just Label It effort that's working to lobby the FDA, led by Gary Hirschberg and, and Stonyfield and a number of corporations to get the FDA to do its job and and there'll be a lot of need for and there's a boycott going on for the Organic Consumers Association about those bastards corporations that went ahead and the and and uh, and paid millions of dollars to uh, to to stop us from knowing what's and in their food. Jonathan Greenberg, including some of the big corporate organic uh, producers, yep. right, that have been bought out uh, by other interests, and even they were dumping money into this campaign. Organic Consumers Association has fantastic lists, as does Cornucopia. Who's who and what's what?
So our guest has been Jonathan Greenberg, uh, beyourgovernment.org, also nogmo.org, K-N-O-W-G-M-O.org. Jonathan Greenberg, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We hope to talk to you again. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Up next on the Project Censored show, Roger D. Harris, the Bay Area Latin American Solidarity Coalition, coming to talk to us about Honduras. Please stay with us after this short musical break. Project Censored Show on Pacific Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. This segment of the show, we're going to get an update on what's been going on in Honduras, a civil rights update, and our guest is Roger D. Harris. Peter? Uh, Roger Harris is with the Task Force on Americas and the Bay Area Latin American Solidarity Coalition. He's just returned from a human rights fact-finding trip to Honduras, um, which has been for literally for centuries ruled by two dominant parties, which is now being challenged by a successful third party, the Libre Party. Um, and uh, there's been some very serious, since the coup two years ago, three years ago now, um, there's been some very serious human rights uh, violations, U.S. involvement to varying degrees. And uh, so give us an update of what's been going on there and some of the new reports that are emerging. Roger. Well, thank you. Um, this will be my third visit since the coup, the military coup of 2009, June 28th, when the democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya was overthrown by a U.S.-backed coup in um, Honduras. After that coup, the, a gigantic resistance movement emerged. And um, I was able to visit there with uh, other friends and, and political activists. Uh, in September of, of 2010, uh, for the anniversary of the, well, actually for the uh, celebration of, Latin Amer- of Central American independence. Then last year in, in 2011, um, I went there for the second anniversary of the coup, and then again now. Each time, the mood was substantially different. The political background was substantially different. This time, we had two things going on. One thing was that the repression has increased, increased dramatically since the coup. Um, the uh, Center of Constitutional Rights ha- just sent, sent out a report uh, trying to bring the Honduran government before the International Criminal Court. And that report, and I'll quote it here, uh, concludes, the gravity of the situation in Honduras facing human rights defenders, those in opposition to ruling authorities, trade unionists, journalists, and increasingly land rights advocates cannot be overstated. So that's the background. To this background, though, is the opposition, which is jubilant because they just broke the monopoly of these two parties that have ruled for over a century, interrupted only by military dictatorships, and they have a legitimate chance in a year from now of taking the presidency and the government. The report quite clearly says that since the coup, the coup of June um, 2009, violent 
political pers- pers- persecution, targeted killings, deprivation of fundamental rights have continued unabated. And at the same time, there's U.S. involvement in the anti-drug um, occupation forces. And so are we complicit in, in this repression? Is the U.S. complicit in that, Roger? This is a... Um I'll give you the answer what the answer that we got throughout our travels through Honduras. Everywhere we went when we spoke to resistance people, there was no illusions that this was simply the local oligarchy, the t- the 10 to 12 ruling families. Every time we spoke to somebody, no matter how left or right they were, they said this was made in Washington DC. Um they they have a, a joke there. They say um there was a um a coup in Honduras, but there was no coup in um, Washington, D.C. Why is that? The answer is there's no U.S. ambassador in Washington, D.C. Um, for us, we, of course, only saw the, the tip of the iceberg, but this time, um, this third visit, even the military presence of the United States, which has stepped up significantly, we could see the difference. Right out of the box, we landed in Tegucigalpa, which there's been some um, safety improvements in the, the airport at the capital city. It's no longer the world's most dangerous airport. It's only the second most dangerous airport. Um, but when we landed in Tegucigalpa, got out of the plane, between the plane and immigration t- um, passport control, there was a kiosk for the Joint Task Force Bravo, a U.S. Honduran task force with a U.S. soldier there meeting and greeting people coming off the plane. Now just imagine if you landed from an international trip at SFO and somebody and before you even showed your passport there was a Honduran military person meeting and greeting Honduran militaries coming into your country. Just think about that. Next morning, our first morning, full morning of the delegation, we stopped off at the Palmolero um, Air for, um, military base. I'd been there twice before in the last two delegations. There were resistance uh, um, uh, demonstrations there. This time, it's, it's just outside of Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras. And this time, we just stopped there to sort of stretch our legs as a, like a public bus stop there. And also just to um, see a historic place. This, this um, base was famous during the Contra War, where the U.S. used it as a major base against the Nicaraguan um, Sandinistas. And it was also the place where when President Zelaya, when he was kidnapped, and taken out of the country before being flown to Costa Rica, they stopped and sent him. They stopped there at at that military base. Now the facade of that base is that it's a Honduran base. There happens to be some U.S. soldiers there, but it's Honduran. And every time we'd been there before, there was Honduran soldiers out there. We got out of our van, and getting out of a van was like kicking a hornet's nest. Immediately, this U.S. Uh, soldier, his name is Matos, his, had, was, uh, has his, his name on his shirt, comes running out with a pistol in, on his side and his hand on the pistol. And he had his hand on the pistol the whole time, followed by another U.S. soldier, Rodriguez, hand on the pistol. Um, not, we were confronted by U.S. military personnel in Honduras. And that was a, something that was a new development. And that, that of course, is, was echoed by the many people that we spoke to, that the, the DEA, DEA is there, that there are a number of people, that um, U.S. military from Iraq and and Afghanistan campaigns who are now involved in what is called the um, war on drugs, but is also a counterinsurgency thing against the land movements. Can you talk to us, Roger D. Harris, a little bit more about these these land movements and about this opposition uh, to the coup. You, you mentioned the Center for Constitutional Rights earlier. I just wanted to re-mention it for listeners. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights actually talked about the release of Honduran True Commission report, which condemned the continuing attacks on human rights defenders. Um, it should be noted then the, the True Commission was established by something called the Platform for Human Rights 
as an alternative to the official Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was seen widely as part of this post-coup government effort to whitewash all this, uh, the efforts that had gone on. Um, and what you're saying is that there's stepped-up U.S. involvement here. It's on the ground. It's visible. But you also say then there is this uh, significant opposition. Can you talk more about that? Right. The, the in, One of the interesting things, Mickey, that we... To, um, encountered this time is that nobody was in favor of the coup, of course, within the resistance. Um, it, it was a tragedy, and it's a continuing and growing tragedy. But time and time again, people said there was a silver lining to that. They said it opened our eyes. We thought we had democracy, but we didn't. We now know that the government, that our country is not run by the people, it's run by the oligarchy, and that oligarchy is based by the support of the United States and the U.S. corporations, as well as other transnational companies, uh, particularly the um, Canadian mining comp- companies. The um, and to every story, there's a backstory. Um, one of the backstories is Hurricane Mitch happened in 1998, and Hurricane Mitch was a big tragedy, um, somewhat of a natural tragedy, but also a, a, a human tragedy because the people that were hit hardest were the people in the most vulnerable real estate. And like our Katrina, uh, Hurricane Mitch had a situation where the government just neglected the poor people the popular classes, the working people. And that was a big lesson. They didn't take it lying down, though. Community organizations and community involvement was stepped up. And it's those type of organizations that persist to this day, now particularly in the countryside, amongst the campesinos, the, the peasants, they're very, very highly organized. Um, and they have present, um, peasant cooperatives that jointly own land and and um, and work work the land. And during various times, including the last time when Zelaya was in power, there've been land reforms where the peasants have been given back the lands that was rightfully theirs. But then the oligarchy, the the rich landowners, try to get it back from them. And this is an ongoing war and a serious war. Over 80 campesino leaders have been murdered since the coup. Most recent one was yesterday. A leader of a rural co-op is a secretary of a rural co-op. I just got the email last night. Um, a picture of his bullet, bullet-ridden body was shot. He was driving a motorcycle home. He was a, a leader of, of, the pe- of one of the peasant movement groups. Um, got killed. And this has become a weekly um, occurrence. The the um, Honduran people, uh, of course, are terrorized by this. They, 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 there's no question about that. But it's it strengthened the resistance. And one of the things that they've asked for is international support to to raise their the um, their profile and to bring these things to the court of international op- opinion. And may, maybe we should go into that some more too. The traditional parties in Honduras, liberal and nationalist parties, national party, are were both pretty much supporting the status quo and the uh, the ruling families. Now there had been some liberal adjustments and 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 that, but what you're saying now is that there's this new party called the Libre Party, which has a serious capabilities of actually perhaps even taking the presidency if they're allowed to evolve. What's the status of that, and who's behind it? Well, this is, this is a, a really a very interesting story, um, and it has a lot of lessons for our, our work here in the United States. Um, after the coup, there was a massive resistance that built up. Of course, there's a, there's a backstory to every one of these stories, and the backstory there was prior to the coup, there were grassroots organizing groups. There was the Los Nesios, which was a youth, radical youth group, um, a left, leftist group, which just this year celebrated its 13th anniversary. There was Bloque Popular, which was uh, based in the um, trade union movements in the, in the urban urban centers. There was Copin, a indigenous group in in the campos, um, based with mainly the Lenca people, the Garifuna people, the Afro Indian people were highly organized. They became the germ for the big resistance. The 
For four months after the coup, the resistance was on the streets with tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of people daily. Um, but you can't do that forever. You can't sustain that without a victory. And by nineteen, by 2011, the um, street demonstrations had, had re- reduced and the um, resistance had formed a political organization, organization, the FRNP, the Popular Front, National Popular Front for the Resistance. Um, but that um, group was beginning to factionalize. One part said, let's do elections and turn ourselves into an electoral party. The other, other current said, no, that will end up blunting our, our radical edge. We should do grassroots organization and we found the country. And then another group, which wasn't organized, just dropped out. What the resistance was able to do in this last year was remarkable. They were able to bring all these different disparate currents together into a single organization with a dual strategy, an electoral arm called the Libre Party, and the resistance itself being the grassroots mass organizing party designed to re um, f- um, formulate the country to have a constituent assembly to um, to redo the constitution and and do every- everything else like that so what what we saw now in less than in, in one year 's time very the entire resistance uniting around a single program but within that program there are currents, so we have both diversity and unity. The various currents represent very diverse political positions, all in opposition to the government and to the status quo and to the oligarchy and to the U.S. involvement, but the, the diverse as well. And in the um, election right now, there were four different currents within the Libre Current, Libre Party. Libre stands for Liberation and Refoundation. The report, Impunity in Honduras, that has come out now, um, is available on the Internet. It's from the Center for Constitutional Rights. It calls for the International Criminal Court to become get involved in this. Is, is there any prospect that that could happen? One of the things that Mickey mentioned um, was that the report um, relied on the True Commission, which was a commission designed by the resistance to expose the um, the atrocities that came came about. But in addition, there was another commission called the Truth Commission, which was the government's own commission. The Center for Constitutional Rights report is based on even the government's own admissions that there were crimes against humanity. Um, there, and like everything else, there's a legal aspect, but there's also the, the importance of developing a political movement behind it. And, and, and maybe I can get into that just a bit, because everywhere we went in Honduras, every person we went, we got more hugs and kisses and stuff like that. You couldn't believe it. They were very happy to see internationals there. We were invited by the resistance to come there. And the, the message was, we need international support. And we're building for the general election, which is a year from now, November 23rd. The Libre Party has a chance of winning the electoral victory. But there's no guarantee that what they call the gold pieces, the people who perpetrated the coup, won't take it away from them again. And for that, they need strong international backing. We've been speaking with Roger D. Harris. Uh, Roger, we have to wrap this segment up. You can learn more at ccrjustice.org. But, Roger, do you have a website or something that you'd like to give out or an announcement you'd like to make? Yes. If you'd like to hear more about this, um, there's two ways of doing this. Um, This coming Thursday, we're going to have a... A public forum where some of the other delegates that were on this this delegation will be presenting. That will be in San Francisco at the Redstone Building. The Redstone Building's at 16th and Cap. Again, Thursday, December 6th, and it's at 7 p.m. in San Francisco. We really invite you to come. That's sponsored by the Bay Area Latin American um, Solidarity Coalition and its constituent groups. If you'd like to find out more, please um 
a look at the Task Force on the Americas. Our, our web address is MITF, the initials MITF, org, and we'd be very happy to tell you more, and particularly we want to find people who want to come to Honduras to stand in solidarity with the social justice movements there. Roger D. Harris, thanks so much for your work. Thanks for joining us here on the Project Censored show. Uh, we'll certainly be checking back in with you for more updates in the future. Thank you very much. After a short musical break, we'll be back with an update on the U.S. drone war and some events taking place here on drones in the Bay Area. Stay with us. <laughs> Project Censored show on the Morning Mix, Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Our final brief segment this morning is an update on the U.S. drone war, specifically focusing on how the anti-war movement challenges the U.S. drone war. And there's going to be a San Francisco Bay Area tour uh, that's taking place here beginning December 1. And it's going actually there are several events uh, December 1st in Berkeley at the Unitarian Universalist Church Cedar at Bonita, uh, Sunday, December 2nd in Oakland. Um, we're going to be joined here by activist Jeff Mackler, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about this. Uh, December 3rd on Monday, Office of San Francisco Bay Area Care, the Council on American Islamic Relations. Also in the South Bay in Palo Alto, the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center, the Community Media Center. There's an event there Tuesday, December 4th, and Wednesday, December 5th in San Jose at San Jose Peace and Justice Center. But uh, to talk a little bit more about these upcoming events and, more importantly, what's going to be discussed there, uh, people from the United National Anti-War Coalition, Veterans for Peace, and many, many others, uh, we're joined by activist uh, Jeff Magler. Are you with us? Glad to be with you. Am I on? You are. You are on the air. Thanks oh, for joining great. us. Okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, we have uh, uh, four representatives touring the Bay Area from actually this Sunday, uh, December 2nd through December 5th. All of them were participants in the 31-person delegation to Pakistan just a few weeks ago, where they met with anti-drone activists and who were victims of the dropping of U.S. bonds. Uh, drones on civilians. They documented 760 murders of innocents. That is, we're supposed to be bombing only terrorists. But of course, these were civilians who had no notice, uh, no charges against them. They were just blown out of existence, women and children and men. We met even with the U.S. ambassador, who had to say the acting ambassador, and I was not part of the delegation. We had hoped to have Joe Lombardo on, but he's in Canada, and we had a technical glitch this morning. But uh, Joe and uh, Leah and others uh, met with the acting U.S. ambassador, who had to say, officially speaking, uh, there are no civilian casualties. And then we presented him, or the delegation did, with 760 murdered people. And uh, all he could do is say, uh, I am not at liberty to confirm this information. But confirm it, uh, the delegation did. They traveled to Karachi. They traveled to uh, Waristan, which is the <clears throat> region with the most intense <clears throat> bombing. Drone warfare is the norm these days. Uh, we just, uh, it was just reported by the U.S. government that prior to the election, the Obama administration had, uh, direct, had drawn up secret, uh, executive orders on, uh, deciding exactly who could be killed. 
uh, because they uh, anticipated a possibility of a loss to the Republicans, and they didn't want the Republicans, who are evil people, as we know, to drop their own executive orders. And the government has admitted that the United States has killed uh, 2,500 people in 300 drone attacks around the world. And I'm very doubtful that any one of those 300 so-called terrorists have been notified. Drone warfare is part of the uh, privatized army warfare, secret warfare, death squad warfare of the United States. So we will be touring uh, Joe Lombardo, who is the national leader of UNAC, uh, Leah Bolger, who is the national president of the Veterans for Peace, and Tony Bloom and Diana Budd, who are with Code Pink, the group that actually sponsored the 31-person delegation. Let me give you some information. The first event um, is going to be this Sunday at the Berkeley Fellowship of Unitarians at Cedar and Benita at 2.30 to 5. And then the same Sunday at my house, we are having Jeff Mackler cook a world-class meal for anti-war activists to meet with the four touring um, anti-war activists here and to socialize and have in-depth discussion, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock. We have Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday events all at 7 o'clock in San Francisco, in Peninsula, uh, in Palo Alto, and in San Jose. Activists from the Muslim communities will be present, and we invite you to attend all for the specifics. You can reach me at 510-268-9429 or uh, email J, the initial, Mackler, M-A-C-K-L-E-R, at L-M-I dot net, and I will give you the details of the entire tour, send you a flyer, and uh, once again, you can call me. Love to have you over for dinner on Sunday at 7 at my house at 510-268-9429. Jeff, you want- Jeff, it's... Um- Really good to see the United <clears throat> National yeah. Anti-War Coalition in cooperation with Code Pink. Um, and, of course, uh, Code Pink uh, um, has been very active in this, and it was this delegation in Pakistan. Uh, they spoke up our way a couple weeks back, uh, uh, Toby Blamey, and was very, very strong. I mean, the, uh, this effort to address dro- drone warfare worldwide has to come from a grassroots mobilization inside the United States. And as we become aware of this, it, it's extremely important. So I applaud your efforts in coordinating these four events over the next week. Well, thank you very much. And I'll tell you, it has been a joy to work with Veterans for Peace and Code Pink. We established a real team of, uh, of diverse uh, forces in the anti-war movement to go to Pakistan and um Pink and UNAC and Veterans for Peace activists are now touring the entire United States uh, to uh, explain exactly the horror that, that we are confronting and to try to organize the fight back. Okay, well, we're out of time right now, but uh, Jeff, it was good to hear your voice, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you at one of these events. Terrific. Thank you very much. With you. Up now, we have a, a, one announcement here. Operation Terror, the 9-11 fact and fiction movie, will be showing at Diablo Valley College in the Forum next to the library in Pleasant Hill, California, as a benefit for No Lies Radio. That is Thursday, December 6th at 7 p.m., Operation Terror, 9-11 fact and fiction. Also, Steve Zelter is involved in an event at San, a University of San Francisco. That's tonight, Friday, November 30th. That's a labor tech uh, program, University of San Francisco, 5 to 7 p.m. registration. And at 7 p.m., there's a talk on privatization of education with Danny Weil and others. So uh, that is happening this evening. Also, coming up here December 8th and 9th, don't forget to check out the KPFA Crafts Fair. Project Censored in the Morning Mix people will be there. Also, tomorrow night in Santa Rosa, we have the Project Censored book release for the North Bay. It is at 99 6th Street at the Arlene Francis Center. That's tomorrow night. Project Censored Book Party at 7 p.m. We'll be there for food and cocktails. 8 p.m. program, $15 donation. Nobody turned away. Thanks again for joining us this morning. This is KPFA 94.1 FM, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF and Fresno and online at kpfa.org. Up next, Democracy Now! 
This is a listing of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending December 9th. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen closely for contact numbers. On Wednesday, December 5th from 7 to 9 p.m., there will be a screening and panel discussion of the film Mother, Caring for Seven Billion. The film highlights the journey of a mother and child rights activist centered around population, society, and lifestyle. This event takes place at 1606 Milvia at Cedar in Berkeley. For details, call 510-848-9061. On Thursday, December 6th, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., Professor Marilee Shelton will host Egypt, the Art of Revolution. The roots of the Egyptian Revolution go back to the popular uprising of January 2011 and the fall of President Hosni Mubarak. This free event takes place at 2100 Moore Park Avenue, San Jose. For details, call 408-298-2121, extension 3229. On Saturday, December 8th, from 9.30 a.m. to 10 p.m., the Bay Area's 27th annual Tibet Fair will celebrate with food, art, culture, dance, and education about the situation in Tibet. This event takes place at 1701 San Pablo Avenue in Berkeley. Tickets range from $15 to $30. For details, call 510-893-1850 or 415-264-3264. The community calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program, send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley 94704 or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible and to hear this calendar again, call 510 848 